Hello and welcome. You're watching To The Point. From India's point of view, the relationship that's had the greatest attention and probably the most success under Prime Minister Modi is India's relationship with the United States of America. But how is that relationship viewed by the Obama administration and by people in Washington? That's the key issue I shall pursue today with America's Deputy Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Mr. Blinken, let me start with a simple question. 18 months into the Modi government, during which time President Obama and Prime Minister Modi have met, I believe, some seven times, mm. how would you today characterize Indo-US relations? I think it's very straightforward for us. President Obama sees the relationship between the United States and India as foundational foundational for so many of the things that we're trying to achieve heading into, uh, into this new century. And when you look at the evolution of the relationship, it's quite extraordinary. Go back 10 years, trade between our countries at about $30 billion. Now we're at over $100 billion, and the Prime Minister and President have committed to multiplying that five times in the coming years. There were no defense sales uh, with our countries. Now there are. That's robust and increasingly robust. Students. 30,000 Indians studying in the United States. Now it's well over 100,000, and we're going to expand that uh, even further. So there's been a continuum and an evolution, but I would say that it's accelerated uh, over the last, uh, the last couple of years. And I think that's a product of the determination that both President Obama and Prime Minister Modi have, because I believe they both see this relationship as vital to the interests of both uh, the American people, the Indian people, but increasingly people around the world. And I'm struck finally by Prime Minister Modi's conception of what is increasingly a global partnership where the United States and India are working not just to the benefit of Americans and Indians but increasingly to the benefit of people around the world. Would you therefore say that the relationship is at the best it's ever been historically because there have been high points in the past. Mm. One that comes to mind is Pandit Nehru and mm. JFK. There have been high points with Vajpayee and Clinton mm. but today would you say this is at its best? Look, it's always hard to, uh, to compare, and you're absolutely right that there have been um, periods of intense cooperation and progress. I think work Americans and Indians did many decades ago, uh, for example, in the area of agriculture, have had profound impacts not only here but uh, around the world. But here's what I think is different. The, it's not just the intensity, but we're faced with an incredibly complex series of challenges. I think more complex than at any time in history. And as a result, it's my sense that the United States and India are working together in more areas than they ever have before and seeking to deepen their cooperation. Now, five days ago, the White House Press Secretary, Josh Ernest, said, and I'm quoting him, President Obama has found Prime Minister Modi to be someone who is honest and direct, mm -hmm. somebody who has good command of the facts, somebody who has a clear understanding of the issues that confront his country and our relationship. Have the two heads of government established a close rapport which today is now lifting the relationship between their countries? Well, I think uh, our spokesperson, Mr. Ernest, said it very well, and it would be hard for me to uh, improve on that. Uh, but I do think it reflects uh, the, uh, the relationship, our sense of the uh, relationship. Um, from what I've seen personally, uh, the President and the Prime Minister have a very strong and good uh, rapport. But would you call them friends? Look, I don't want to characterize, that would be up to them to characterize the relationship, but all I can tell you is um, they work very well together. But it's grounded in a very simple proposition, and that is that the Prime Minister, I think, well, I don't want to speak for him, but I believe that he believes that this relationship is fundamentally important to India, just as President Obama believes that it's fundamentally important to the United States. That is what's driving their work together. Let's come to two areas where perhaps one needs a certain clarity because many believe in India it's missing. In January when President Obama came to India he said that on the nuclear liability issue mm. a breakthrough understanding had been achieved. Mm. But the New York Times said in fact what was achieved was vague and inconclusive mm. and they compared it to kicking the problem into the long grass. Mm. Now 11 months later not a single American company has moved to set up a nuclear plant in mm. India. What's holding them up? Or is it the case that the New York Times skepticism was more accurate than President Obama's description? Actually, I think we're moving uh, well ahead uh, on exactly that issue. Uh, I, my understanding is that uh, ratification is impending uh, for uh, things that India needs to do. Um, but what I'm hearing from our companies, uh, including from Westinghouse, 
uh, which is in active discussions uh, with India on uh, building uh, nuclear plants. Those are moving forward. Uh, those discussions are moving forward. Uh, countries, uh, companies like General Electric also uh, very interested in pursuing this. So my strong sense is that we actually now have real forward movement. But they've been said to be moving forward for mm. the last two years. In fact, that was what was said when Dr. Manmohan Singh was mm. in office. Mm. And moving forward hasn't yet led to someone actually doing something concrete and actually signing a deal or arranging for a plan mm. to come up. When will that begin to happen? I tell you what, let's sit together again in six months and see where we are. And you, I will bet you that there is real progress. In six months' let's time, you say to Let's me, just arbitrarily, let's look at getting back together in six months. I believe that we will see demonstrable progress in that area in over, six the next six, time. over the next six months. A second issue that's come up, and it's come up literally in the last three days, the president of the U.S.-India Business Council, mm -hmm. Mukesh Aghi, has said to the newspaper The Hindu that American companies are looking to invest some $41 billion in India in areas and sectors like infrastructure, mm -hmm. defense, healthcare, e-commerce, and renewable energy. Mm -hmm. But, he adds, bureaucratic red tape in India mm -hmm. and the absence of a bilateral investment treaty mm. is actually holding things up. And mm. what I want to ask you is this, A, is that accurate and can you confirm it? And if it is, mm. have you taken up these issues with the Indian government and what response do you get? Mm. So I think we're seeing two things. One, you are seeing a significant increase that, that I noted earlier just over the last decade in uh, trade and investment. But this but, is intention only at the moment. Right. But what we're also seeing, I think what we're hearing from our companies is that they're looking uh, to some additional work that would uh, be done to create the best possible investment climate. What companies are looking for is predictability, is certainty, and tra is transparency. So, for example, uh, regulatory frameworks uh, are very important. Um, knowing that they won't be hit with retroactive taxation uh, is important. Having a clear dispute resolution mechanism, if, as often happens in business, some kind of dispute or difference arises. So I know that India is looking at various things in those areas. That would be important. The, the Bilateral Investment Treaty also would be a very strong signal that India really is fully open to investment, not just from the United States, but from others. Let me take up the Bilateral Investment Treaty because it's something that is not just critical to American business, but more importantly, it's something you've been negotiating with the Indian government since mm. 2008. Mm -hmm. Now, seven years is an awfully long time to keep mm. talking without a productive result. Is there a sense that perhaps the Indian government or the Indian system mm. is moving slower than it should be? Look, I think you'd have to ask um, colleagues in, uh, in the Indian government, but I believe that uh, our presidents and prime minister uh, have a commitment to move this forward. They have a commitment and a goal of dramatically expanding uh, trade between our countries from the already relatively high level that it's at. Um, and the bilateral investment treaty would be a very important mechanism to do that. Now, India has uh, such uh, mechanisms with other countries, Japan, Korea, uh, ASEAN countries. Um, we believe that there's no reason why we can't r relatively rapidly conclude such an agreement if we both put in the energy and the emphasis. Six, about a moment ago, with great confidence, mm -hmm. you gave me a six-month mm -hmm. period mm -hmm. within which we would see concrete movement mm -hmm. in terms of the nuclear deal. Mm -hmm. Can you give me a time frame within which the bilateral investment treaty will come into being? Look, there's a lot on all of our agendas right now. The first thing is we have to get through Paris and the, uh, the climate talks, hopefully over the next uh, few days. Uh, we have a very important WTO meeting. Uh, at the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the coming weeks. That's important too. Um, in the United States, uh, we've concluded recently the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement. We're working on digesting that. But as all of that goes on, we're engaged, including in my conversations just over the last two days, uh, in the Bilateral Investment Treaty and in other aspects of advancing the commercial relationship between our countries. Audiences hearing your answer may say to themselves that what he's actually suggesting in the politest possible way is that the bilateral investment treaty is not going to happen in a hurry. There are other things that take priority. This will happen, but it could take a year or two, maybe more. Look, I can't, I can't put a time frame on it. All I can tell you is this. I think there is a recognition that this would be uh, an additional important piece in being able to do what the Prime Minister and President Obama have set out to do, which is significantly expand 
our trade and investment relationship. You also mentioned retroactive taxation. Mm -hmm. It's an issue that's come to the forefront with Vodafone. It's an issue that matters to investors, not just in America, but virtually mm -hmm. across the world. Do you get a sense of satisfaction from this government? I know they've promised they mm -hmm. won't do it again. Mm -hmm. But there's nothing in the law that stops them. Mm -hmm. So do you get a sense of satisfaction there, or do you think they ought to do more before investors are willing to accept that that problem is resolved? Look, investors have uh, a very strong sense of um, what makes sense for them and what doesn't. And so the market is usually a pretty good indicator of whether the investment climate is as good as it can be uh, and should be or isn't. So let's see how this evolves over the coming months. Now you also come, Mr. Blinken, to India at a time when terror is at the top of the international agenda. You've come to India about three weeks after the horrible mm. attacks in Paris and just mm. days after the killings in San Bernardino mm. and both in a sense have been connected in one way or another with ISIS. Mm -hmm. Three days ago the British paper The Times wrote Islamic State fighters have captured swathes of eastern Afghanistan in a drive to establish a new province of mm -hmm. the group's self-styled caliphate on territory straddling the border with Pakistan. Yeah. And the paper adds, up to 1,600 fighters pledging allegiance to ISIS are ruling much of the five districts south of Jalalabad mm -hmm. with the same ruthlessness that characterizes mm -hmm. the group's regime in Syria and mm -hmm. Iraq. Has ISIS acquired a significant as well as a worrying presence in Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Let me say two things. First, with regard to your specific question, we are extremely vigilant uh, about any indications that ISIS is trying to take root in different countries beyond uh, Syria and Iraq where it's trying to establish its caliphate. And I want to come back to that. Um, and we are seeing uh, a presence in Afghanistan. We're seeing some worrying indicators in Bangladesh. Uh, of uh, terrorist acts that uh, seem to be supported by or instigated uh, by ISIL. Um, but we also see a phenomenon where pre-existing groups that have already been acting uh, and using terrorism take on uh, the ISIS banner because it seems to be the one uh, that has uh, the most salience right now. Uh, and so it's important to understand whether there really are connections between core ISIS in Syria and Iraq and groups in different countries, what the relationship is, and obviously uh, to stop it. And we're very, very focused on that. In the case of Afghanistan, you also have uh, individuals who had been adherents of Al-Qaeda who may have moved over and tried to claim the banner uh, of ISIS. Uh, you even have Taliban uh, who, have, uh, who have done the same thing. But we're extremely vigilant about that. But here's what's important. Um, a year ago, uh, when a little over a year ago, when this problem first emerged full bore in Iraq and Syria. Uh, we put together a coalition that now includes 65 countries. And in the space of that a little over a year, uh, we've made significant progress against uh, the threat. A year ago in Iraq, Baghdad, the capital, was under threat. Erbil, the Kurdish capital, was under threat. The big city of Tikrit was gone. The Mosul Dam, key infrastructure, was gone. ISIL seemed to be on the move throughout the country. Today, to fast forward, a year later, ISIL has lost 40% of the territory it controlled a year ago in Iraq. Baghdad is secure, Erbil is secure, these other places are as well. There's real progress, and it's as a result of the work the coalition has done to support partners on the ground. Even in Syria, which is more challenging, we're making real progress, particularly in cutting off the border between Syria and Turkey, through which much of the support for ISIL has flowed. And this is as a result of this coalition that's come together, working with partners on the ground, but not just on the ground. So important is the comprehensive strategy that we have to work to cut off the financing, to cut off the flow of foreign fighters, to deal with the propaganda that recruits people, to deal with the humanitarian situation. It takes time. It's hard. It's a work in progress. But this campaign is increasingly effective. I want very much to ask you a question about the coalition, because mm. I think the coalition is the fundamental element of the fight against ISIS. Mm. But before I come to the coalition, I want to return to the threat that ISIS potentially poses to the South Asia region. Mm. In a video that they released online a week ago, ISIS said, and I'm quoting, the Islamic State would now expand beyond Iraq and Syria. It would now expand into India, Pakistan, Bangladesh, Afghanistan. And the same manifesto attacked Narendra Modi as a right-wing Hindu nationalist who is preparing his people for a future war against mm. Muslims. How seriously does the United States, which must have the best understanding and mm. the best intelligence on ISIS, mm. how seriously does the United States take that threat? Look, 
we are and we have to take uh, the threat posed by ISIL deadly seriously. And we do wherever it manifests itself. And it's also why we are extremely vigilant and working in cooperative fashion with partners throughout the region and beyond the region to make sure that if ISIL tries to manifest itself anywhere, we're able to stamp it out before it does. Now, one of the things that's happening is as we're exerting more and more pressure on ISIL in Syria and Iraq, um, it's looking to distract and it's looking to take action um, in other places. And at the same time, as we succeed in ISIL, uh, dealing with ISIL in Iraq and Syria, where it's trying to build this so-called caliphate, if you take that away, if you take that foundation away, which is what we're working very hard to do, the entire edifice will start to crumble. What's attracting foreign fighters, what's attracting people to sign up, is this impression that they have that ISIL is succeeding. It's on the move and it's building this mythical caliphate. As we demonstrate that that, in fact, is being taken away, I think you'll start to see the attraction of the group fade more and more, and it will be much less salient uh, than it could be, even in places like uh, India or Bangladesh or Afghanistan. Let me then, in the context of what you've just said, ask you a question about the coalition that you've built mm. up, because the fight against ISIL is one which, even if a country like India isn't directly a part of, mm. is deeply interested in. Mm. And the threat that ISIL poses to South Asia, in a sense, emphasizes the need for you to succeed in that fight. Mm. And President Obama, in a speech from the Oval Office just 36 hours ago, committed America to destroying ISIL. Mm -hmm. My question is this, if he's really serious, hasn't then the time come to accept what Angela Merkel and Lahore Fabius are saying to you, mm -hmm. that maybe you need Bashar Assad's support to help eliminate ISIS, and therefore, at least in the interim, mm -hmm. you need to either postpone or slow down your attempts for regime change. You can't mm -hmm. battle ISIS at the same time as going for regime change in Syria. The two end up contradicting each other. Actually, I believe and we believe that the two are entirely consistent and we have to do both at the same time. Here's why. Mr. Assad has totally forfeited any legitimacy he had uh, to rule Syria. But beyond that, as a result of the violence that he's persecuted against his own people, the vast majority of his people, um, it is impossible to conceive of a Syria that is at peace and stable with Assad uh, leading the country. At the same time, that creates an environment in which ISIL is able to fill a vacuum, and not only fill a vacuum, as long as Assad is present, he is a magnet for foreign fighters, for recruits. ISIL's number one propaganda tool is President Assad. But we believe that, and I believe that uh, the French and Germans would say exactly the same thing, that the way to deal with the challenge posed by Mr. Assad is a political transition that now has more energy and momentum behind it than it's had at any time in the recent Absolutely. past. Absolutely, but the question is what happens to Assad during that transition? Mm -hmm. Because Lavrov Fabius has made it crystal clear mm -hmm. that in fact he believes Assad must remain during that transition, that mm -hmm. in fact the aim to remove him from office needs to be either slowed down and delayed, and clearly Angela Merkel, when she talks about the need to bring Assad on board and talk to him, mm -hmm. is suggesting the same thing. So is there not a difference of opinion in terms of strategy and in terms of handling Assad, mm -hmm. even if not in terms of the overall goal of mm -hmm. defeating ISIS? Uh, two things. Let's focus first on what everyone agrees on, which is actually quite significant. For the first time, all of the outside stakeholders in this problem including not just the Europeans, not just the United States, not just the Saudis uh, and the Gulf countries, but also Russia, Iran, Turkey, all came together around the same table in Vienna. And they agreed on some very important things. They agreed on the need for a political transition. That was a first. But that was before uh, Paris. Uh, no, yes, but, uh, and I'll come to why Paris has actually only increased that need. Um, they agreed on the need for a political transition. By the way, they reaffirmed that after Paris. Second, they agreed that negotiations towards such a transition should begin in January with representatives of the opposition and representatives of the Assad regime. Third, they agreed that within six months there should be a transition in governance that is more representative of the Syrian people pursuant to uh, the agreements that were reached in Geneva uh, a couple of years ago that call for, among other things, a transitional governance acceptable to both sides. And finally, they agreed on the need for elections in 18 months uh, in Syria. 
and they also agreed to work together for a ceasefire as soon as the negotiations begin. So in other words, what's agreed is basically an 18-month period in which that transition would take place. Now, you're exactly right that there are differences over the precise status of Assad at different points in that period. That still needs to be worked out. And those out. are the issues on which you need to convince Rojo Fabius mm -hmm. and Angela Merkel. Are you making ground with them, or do you think that those differences still need to be sorted oh, out? No, no, I think we're very much in the same place with the, with the French and the Germans. I think where there are uh, differences are more with the Russians uh, and, of course, with the Iranians, uh, who present uh, a real challenge. But here's another very important fact, uh, why this has changed and why there's at least more of an opportunity without exaggerating its potential. Uh, and that goes to Russia's intervention uh, in Syria. Um, that's had a couple of very interesting consequences. First, it's increased Russia's leverage over Assad. He owes them. But more important, it's increased the conflict's leverage over Russia. It cannot afford to sustain what it's doing. And I don't mean economically. I mean politically and strategically. Is at risk of alienating virtually the entire Sunni Muslim world, including 15% of its own population that is Sunni Muslim, because it's perceived as being in alliance with Iran, Hezbollah, and Assad. It is now showing a much greater interest in this political transition because it knows that it needs to get out of the problem it's created. Mr. Blinken, let's take a break at that point. When I come back, I want to talk to you about India and Pakistan. You're in India today, you've been in Pakistan this evening. I want to talk to you about the relationship between the two countries as well as the problem of terror that bedevils that relationship. That's in a moment's time. See you after the break. Welcome back, you're watching To The Point, and an exclusive interview with the American Deputy Secretary of State, Antony Blinken. Finally, let's come to India and Pakistan. You're in India today, you're going to Pakistan mm. this evening. As you know, the two countries, after a prolonged period of not talking to each other, mm. they almost seemed as if they were sulking, mm. have actually now begun a process. Mm. The two national security advisors have met in secret in Bangkok. Mm -hmm. They had a four-hour meeting. The foreign secretaries have met. The Indian foreign minister is going to Pakistan this evening. And Sartar Jaziz, her counterpart, has said that he hopes that a schedule of talks can be announced and put in place. How do you, the United States, view the fact that dialogue could be resuming between India and Pakistan? Well, we view this as very positive. Anything that uh, Indians and Pakistanis uh, decide on together uh, to reduce tensions and to improve relations uh, is a very positive thing. And it's something that we, uh, that we strongly support. So we're encouraged uh, by the step that's been taken. Obviously, there is a lot of work to be done uh, going forward, but uh, it's a start and it's something that we strongly support. There's a lot of speculation in India and equally in Pakistan that both prime ministers were nudged into talking to each other by President Obama, possibly by Prime Minister Cameron. Have you been, to use a diplomatic word, encouraging and persuading them? Uh, we've certainly uh, encouraged, but I think uh, what we've seen is um, almost entirely uh, a product of uh, both Pakistan uh, and India uh, deciding what was in their best interests. Uh, that's what I believe is motivating uh, the, uh, the, the discussion that took place uh, in Bangkok and would motivate any further discussions. Um, it's uh, an understanding on the part uh, of both that the best way to advance their common interests uh, and uh, security is uh, to try to see if they can resolve their problems uh, directly. But to say that the Obama administration or the Cameron government pushed them into it, we, that would be an exaggeration? Absolutely. Let's come finally to terror because, as you know, one of the big issues between India and Pakistan is the question of mm -hmm. terror, and terror is an issue on which the United States takes a very high moral stand. Mm -hmm. You know, as well as I do, that the Modi government is troubled by what it sees as the slow, the unconvincing, the dilatory Pakistani response to the 26-11 attacks where six American citizens were killed. Mm -hmm. The Modi government is troubled by the fact that the so-called mastermind of 26-11, mm -hmm. Zakir al Lakmi, is out on bail. No credible effort is being made to re-arrest mm -hmm. him. The cases against him are not being pursued. Mm -hmm. And finally, there's Pakistan's treatment of Hafiz Saeed, mm -hmm. who's actually been designated as a terrorist by the United States. Mm -hmm. You have a $10 million bounty. Now, clearly, on these issues that trouble Mr. Modi, 
There's not very much that he or India can do to push Pakistan to do more. But is the United States equally helpless? Or is these an area, are these issues of low priority for you? Well, first, and you alluded to it, uh, we're bound together by Mumbai and by 2611. Because as you rightly pointed out, uh, along uh, with the many uh, Indians who were killed, uh, were six Americans. Uh, and as a result, uh, even if Americans hadn't been killed, we would have uh, stood with you as we did. Uh, but it's resonated even more uh, because we together uh, lost lives to terrorism. Uh, and so we've stood with you on Mumbai from day one. We continue to do so. Um, we have discussed and raised uh, with our Pakistani colleagues the, uh, this process and um, its uh, lack of, uh, of results uh, on a regular basis. What response do they give you? Well, we've heard different responses. I would let them uh, characterize uh, uh, their response. But, but we've I, made, I, I, all I can are you satisfied with All I can tell you is that we've made, uh, we've made clear that we believe that there needs to be more movement uh, on resolving um, and bringing, uh, bringing to definitive justice uh, anyone who, uh, who was involved. And that remains uh, a subject of, uh, of conversation between us virtually every time uh, uh, that we meet. Um, but I will let the Pakistanis uh, uh, describe their, uh, how they see this issue. Um, Can I ask you this? Mm. Are you satisfied with the responses? Do you get a feeling that they're hearing and acting? Or do you feel they're hearing, but perhaps turning then a deaf ear afterwards? I don't think anyone will be satisfied until justice is done. Uh, it's, you, one can't be satisfied until justice is done. So that's what we're looking to see. Um, second, with regard to um, this challenge more broadly, I think that... The challenge of terror? Yeah. I think that um, there is uh, a growing recognition in Pakistan um, that uh, it too uh, will suffer from the perpetuation of this problem and that it has an interest uh, in, um, in helping to, uh, to solve it. So, the Pakistanis have taken significant action uh, over the last year in North Waziristan. They've also uh, been significantly victimized uh, themselves uh, by terrorism. I think that's contributing to uh, a growing awareness uh, of the need to deal with this problem effectively. You're absolutely right, Mr. Blinken, when you point out that the Pakistani government has taken effective action in Waziristan. You're right when you point out that Pakistan itself is a victim of terror. Mm -hmm. But what comes to my mind is the fact that last month, November, General Rahil Sharif, the Pakistani army mm -hmm. chief, visited Washington. Mm -hmm. He met Vice President Biden. He met Secretary of State Kerry. And both of them congratulated him and applauded him for the tough fight against Pakistan Taliban. Mm -hmm. But did either gentleman point out to him that why not take similar action against the LET and Jesh and the Pakistani jihadi groups that target India? Because the big difference in Indian eyes is that General Raheel Sharif is fighting Pakistan Taliban, mm -hmm. but he is allowing a fairly free hand to the LET and Jesh who target India. Did you point out that dichotomy and inconsistency to him? Yes. You did? Yes. And we've said it publicly and we've said it privately uh, and repeatedly. And but we're also holding uh, General Heal to his own very important statements and commitments that there is no distinction among terrorists. A terrorist is a terrorist is a terrorist. Whether it is uh, the uh, Pakistani Taliban, whether it is LET, whether it's the Haqqani network, uh, all the same thing need to be dealt with. And that's something that he said. Um, so but we're holding. Do you believe what he said? Because we, the distinction is apparent when they don't take action against mm -hmm. LET. So, Indeed, it's important that in our work with, uh, with Pakistan that uh, we continue to engage them on the need to act against all terrorists uh, and not only inwardly directed terrorists who immediately threaten Pakistan, but outwardly directed terrorists who threaten India or threaten the United States or threaten Afghanistan. You said something a moment ago that would be heartening to Indian audiences and to the Indian government that you actually raised this issue oh. with General Sharif. You pointed out to him mm -hmm. that he needs to take the same action against LET and the terrorists targeting India as he is doing against Pakistan Taliban. When you raised the issue, what sort of response did you get? Well, all I can say is this. Um, we are looking to um, his own standard. This is a standard that he himself set 
in making it clear that there should be no distinction among terrorists. And uh, it's important, of course, that that manifests itself uh, in action, but it's a very important uh, statement, uh, and it's something that uh, should be the basis uh, of uh, our collective action going forward. My last question. Do you believe that what has happened in 26-11 was simply the work of non-state actors, or do you accept reports that have come out as a result of evidence from David Headley, mm -hmm. who in fact gave evidence to the FBI, mm -hmm. reports that have come out in books by Adrian Smith, mm -hmm. that suggest that the connections to the Pakistan establishment, the Pakistan army, the Pakistan ISI cannot be ignored. Mm -hmm. I think we have to uh, see that justice is done in uh, a thorough manner and that we are able, uh, through the process uh, of establishing uh, exactly what happened, who was responsible, uh, how it happened, um, exactly what those facts are. Um, that's one reason, among others, uh, that we need this process to move forward uh, in, a more, uh, in a more conclusive way. But let's let the facts uh, emerge and speak for themselves. And this is a priority for you. This is not simply an issue of diplomacy that you're committed to, but it is a priority because American citizens were killed in 2016. This is a priority. Uh, for a number of reasons, but uh, it starts with the fact uh, that Americans were killed, but it is founded on the proposition that if acts of terrorism remain unaddressed, um, then the problem is simply going to get worse. Um, but it's also a conviction that it is ultimately profoundly uh, in Pakistan's self-interest to also do everything it possibly can to arrest this problem, because we know that um, this is something that can come back and bite Pakistan uh, as well as And others. is biting Pakistan, because mm -hmm. as you Indeed. say, they are great victims of terror themselves. They, they are. Tremend tremendous losses. And again, my sense is that there's a growing awareness of that. At the level of General Rahil Sharif as well. Again, we go, to, we go to what he said, which is very important. No distinction among terrorists. A lot of what you said will be very heartening to an Indian audience. Thank you very much. Thank indeed. you. Appreciate it.